This is the examination of the hidden human condition. You're listening to the Hidden Killers Podcast. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruski. Joining me to unravel from a prosecutor's standpoint, what went down with the Lori Vallow Daybell sentencing the other week is former prosecutor Lori Gilbertson and head of Tribeca Blue Consulting. Lori, the eight minute, 30 some minutes preaching that she did, rant that she did. I don't even know what to make of it. It was clearly delusional and clearly was completely off base from the reality that everyone else in the room had just gone through. What was your thoughts on her number one deciding to make a statement? She didn't have to. And then what did she did say? Wow. Well, in terms of her deciding to make a statement, I was thinking honestly about her attorney yeah. and the fact that often you do not want your clients as a defense attorney to speak. Yeah. It's not going to help them any. In fact, it's going to really harm them, which is what we saw here too. And the client is in charge. So As to her making that statement, I really would imagine that her attorney strongly advised her against it and got overruled. And Lori wanted to share with everybody all of the delusional things that were in her head. And, you know, we know this is someone who loves attention. We know this is someone who loves having people listen to her. And it looks like she took this as kind of her shining moment to just share everything that she wanted to. And obviously without any regard whatsoever to how this would affect, you know, the families, how this would affect even her sentencing, if you want to even think about it in her self-interest, yeah. because that's not where her head is, obviously. Yeah, not at all. Obviously, I mean, yeah, especially her self-interest of the sentencing, making the statements, basically just telling everybody else they're wrong and she knows what's right. And that's that. What did you make of the attorney's statements Prior to her giving hers, I was a little bit taken aback by the almost love letter nature of it. (laughs) It it, it was creepy to me. It was like, Laurie is about love. I mean, number one, he didn't have to go that far. It felt like it went above and beyond vigorously defending his client. It it felt very almost like, oh, did she get to him too? (laughs) Yeah. Look, I don't blame you for thinking that. I think my mind went a little bit that way, too. You know, has he been kind of sitting here next to her all of these weeks during this trial and started to actually believe the stuff that he was arguing? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there are so many different ways to handle that. And as a defense attorney and what I saw often as a prosecutor was when your client is convicted and the evidence was overwhelming and you know there's going to be a lot of time. You just do what you can reasonably do to appeal to the judge at sentencing. And what he could reasonably do, which is, I believe what he did was on sentencing, argue that the sentences should be concurrent, that they should run together instead of running consecutive and giving her more time. That's what he could do reasonably. If he had just sat down after that, he would have adequately done his job. But the love part, just don't even know what to make of that. (laughs) It was just bizarre, completely and utterly bizarre. It was a, quite a way to end his representation of her. If this is where their road ends. I, I, I didn't know the crude comment that I made about it the other day right after it happened was, is he like trying to get invited for conjugal visits with Lori? Oh, or, or, <laughs> but because it just, it was, it just seemed yeah. over the top. It did not seem like this is, you're going to be looked down upon if you don't play into this. I was almost insulting, I thought, to the judge, to the families. Yeah. It, if I, I feel like it hurt her more than anything. Not that there was much that was going to be saved or a lighter sentence was going to be given, but it just really showed a, an utter lack of understanding of the perception that she's given everyone and the actions that she's taken for earning those perceptions. Oh, yes. And to say, as I have read about him saying and heard him saying that she's the most hated woman in America. Well, she's the one that made it that way, Yeah, right? She's the one that murdered her young children. She is the one who is responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And his job as an attorney, especially at sentencing, even though he had 
the only thing that comes to mind is a snowball's chance in hell of yeah. getting anything is to mitigate that in some way, because where there is some acceptance of responsibility, where there is some remorse, where there is some consideration for the victim's feelings, not to say that would sway the judge, but at least it shows they're living in reality. And it was obvious here from her in that eight minute crazy soliloquy that she is obviously not living in reality, but I was a bit surprised to see that her attorney was not either. Yeah, and there is still another trial for Lori if it takes place. The, she'll be extradited to Arizona eventually here by the end of the year is what they're looking at to face the charges and the death of Charles Vallow. Is this someone who should be standing trial anymore after what we saw the other day? Not grounded in reality, may be able to go through the motions, and she seems to be aware of what's happening around her, but the reality part is not there. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I was doing some more research and looking up in terms of, you know, the first thing that came to mind of it, you know, was about her mental health. And we know that Idaho does not have that insanity defense. And, you know, you look at Arizona and what would happen to her there if she were not really competent to even stand trial. When you look at someone who has been sentenced to life terms, she is not going anywhere ever. You mm -hmm. think about out, is it a good use of resources to try that case? Because she does seem like someone who is not going to ever be grounded in reality enough to plead guilty mm -hmm. to anything and to kind of save the state and the victims, those resources, that time, that energy, and obviously the heartache for the victims, you know, the rest of the victim's family and loved ones. So the state gets put in a bit of a bind that way with thinking about what is the right thing to do. You still do have a victim who deserves, you know, a victim who whose name and life deserves some justice. So the idea of dismissing that can be really harmful sure. to the loved ones of the victim who feel like, you know, even though this person may be in jail forever for someone else, they didn't get their day in court. Their loved one didn't mm -hmm. get justice. So it's a lot of things to weigh. And there I think is. we'll see more of it as the case moves along and how the prosecution and the defense are going to start handling it. And I don't know, Tony, is her current lawyer, I would assume not representing her in Arizona. She's going to have someone new. You know, I don't know the answer to that. I would assume okay. it's a different representation, but I just don't Me know too. for sure. And maybe she will have an attorney more grounded in reality <laughs> who will choose to handle this in a more pragmatic way than spouting uh -huh craziness about love or she's gonna reel another one in she has a way or of doing is. that <laughs> well we're, we're gonna have a lot to talk about in the coming months with that one yes we are this is an examination of the hidden human condition this is the hidden killers podcast the hidden killers podcast with tony brewski